Okay, so um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Klaus and uh, Klaus Hüffel on, on Twitter. I work for a company called here um, near Nordmannhof. We do uh, location and map services. And I work as a, as a tech lead. I support the IS team who does the consumer app. So if you search in the app store for here we go, then uh, that's the app we work on. But uh, tonight I want to talk about running Swift on Lambda, like Amazon Web Services Lambda. Does everyone know what AWS Lambda is about? Many do. Uh, so basically what I want to present tonight is a bit like an overview. What is Lambda about? Why, why is this a cool thing? Um, I'll talk a bit about how to get Swift running on, on there. It's not too difficult, but there's um, a few uh, tricks you have to know. And then I'm going to do, do a demo. And my demo, um, the reason why I have started this um, at all is that I implemented an Alexa skill on Lambda based on Swift. So Alexa is the voice, Amazon's voice services. Like you have a loudspeaker at your home, you talk to Alexa and it tells you answers. And the skill I wrote um, is actually available in the App Store. It tells you the three most popular artists on uh, Spotify. And this is written in Swift. Um, so talking about um, Amazon Lambda, um, this is something um, that's a, a good name for it is function as a service. It's basically a piece of code that gets executed with the idea that you don't have to worry about any servers or the environment where it gets executed. Um, serverless architecture is not su such a good name, but serverless is often called as well, because obviously there are servers involved, it's just not your service, and you don't need to um, um, uh, worry about these, these servers because Amazon handles it for, for you. Um, it's basically um, the difference between, let's say, running a, a Docker image or something like Heroku is that it's more fine-grained, like it's really one function that gets executed. It's not like an entire server that's get put it out in long run. And um, this is basically maybe the, the best definition from ThoughtWorks. They called it event triggered, ephemeral, and fully managed by a third party. So event triggered, it could be an API call or Alexia calls, Alexa calls you, or something gets uploaded on S3. That's an event. It triggers your your code. Ephemeral means it's running for only for a short time, maybe uh, 20 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds to compute the result, and then the server goes away. So this is what ephemeral is about, and it's fully managed by Amazon. So I, need to, I don't need to say, give me 10 servers or give me 100. It basically starts as many servers, um, servers as it needs to be, and the granularity of this is uh, function calls. So um, you never have the problem where you have one server, but maybe every hour someone calls calls you, then basically you need one server anyway to serve these requests. Basically, the function call gets executed, the server gets shut down, and then you only pay for what gets actually uh, for this um, exact uh, single uh, function call. There, there are a couple of, com of competitors of, of, of this context, um, of, of this uh, concept. There's Google Cloud Function, Azure has something, IBM OpenWhisk. But usually when people talk about serverless and function as a service, they talk about um, Amazon's Lambda. That's, that's the most well-known um, service. Um, OpenWhisk is a bit interesting because from the start, they natively support Swift, executing Swift code, whereas with uh, Lambda, I'll show you how, how, how to do this. Um, so the, the, the concept of function as a server or serverless, it comes with a lot of promises that people um, tend to think um, are, are cool. Um, obviously, there's also a bit of hype around it. It's something, a, fa a fairly new concept, so let's uh, figure out what actually to do with it. And what Amazon promises you is you don't have any servers to manage, and uh, this is pretty much true, yes. Um, you don't have to reserve any instances or start any. Um, some people then uh, call this concept no ops, like no operations at all, which isn't quite true, because you still have to monitor what's going on, right? You have to monitor your function. Maybe there are errors. Maybe something doesn't work as expected. You have still need tooling to actually upload your function code and update it um, to the servers. So there is less maintenance and less operations involved, but there is still something you need to do. And um, continuous scaling, um, that's what I mentioned. Um, basically, Amazon starts as many servers for your function as necessary, and the granularity is very fine-grained, right? So uh, um, if you want to have two functions per hour or a thousand functions per hour, it doesn't really matter. Um, there are limits. Um, for example, you, one Lambda function can um, execute only for five minutes. 
Um, usually you would implement something that's far more quicker than that, but what I've seen, for example, someone implementing uh, a continuous integration, continuous integration system on Lambda, where maybe unit tests run longer than five minutes. So there's a bit of a restriction there. And it's also, I think, um, there, there's some limits on how many uh, function calls um, you can do per account on Amazon. Um, Sub-second metering, so basically you only um, pay for what actually gets executed. It usually runs in a few hundred milliseconds, and this is basically what you're paying. And uh, what you can adjust is the, um, uh, the, the, the memory that is given to your function. It starts with 128 um, gigabyte, goes um, up very high. This is a bit where um, Swift is interesting because it's very memory compute efficient. So with 128 gigabytes, it's actually uh, quite a lot. Uh, you can do that. Megabyte. You guys are big guys. Yeah. How much memory do you have for the Just, just do. <laughs> so that's uh, the, the the promise. So the question is, um, I'm an iOS app developer. Um, um, I use uh, Swift for some apps. Um, so obviously, I'm interested in uh, um, running Swift on 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 Lambda as well. Um, I think Swift on server is interesting because it extends a bit your skill set. Like if you have refactored the hundreds view controller into something smaller, then maybe it's time to move on to something um, uh, different. And um, I think it's, it's, it's really wonderful that as an app developer, you can also do some server-side stuff. And there's a lot of cool stuff out there like Slack boards, Messenger boards, Alexa skills that you can easily um, implement in Swift. So how do you get um, Swift running? Um, natively, they support Node.js, Python, Java, and I believe C Sharp recently. Um, Swift is not natively supported. So basically what you have to do is there is a blueprint called Node exec. What this means is you write a little JavaScript um, a function that uses um, a, a, a library called child process. You ex execute an external process. This is your Swift program. And then the Swift program does what, it, what, it, what it's supposed to do, and you return it to the JavaScript and return it to Lambda. So this is basically you have to build um, your Swift code into one executable, a, a bit like a command line uh, program that you use for this. And then you run it through um, a uh, JavaScript um, script. And uh, this is nothing unusual. Um, there are projects that do this for Go or any other natively compiled um, 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 uh, programming languages. That's why they also offer these uh, Um So here's an example of this um, um, uh, JavaScript code. Um, it's a bit packed, perhaps. But basically, you, um, this is JavaScript, so you require this child process um, library. And basically, you set up, you tell it um, which, which command to do. Then you call exec on this, and then um, basically you return this um, to, to, to the handler. So basically, Amazon is calling this handler with an event. That's your data that you um, are given. Um, and the context is uh, basically the, the, the environment. So what you have to do is basically you um, pass, as with a normal, normal uh, command line program, you have to pass um, your parameters into this um, uh, um, Swift executable where standard in, and then um, it computes something and you pass the result back and we are standard out, and this is what the JavaScript um, um, uh, JavaScript um, script uh, passes and gives back to Amazon. Um, so to actually get um, a Swift executable, it's a bit more involved. Um, basically, of course, you have to, to, to build your, uh, your, your program. But it's more involved because unlike Go, um, Swift doesn't have a static um, uh, build version. Like basically, um, you need some dynamic libraries together with your Swift executable. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Like at the moment, um, you cannot actually um, create a static executable that has all dependencies baked in. Um, so how, how how do you get to these uh, dynamic libraries? Um, so basically, what I'm using is a, is a script. I'm running LDD, like the Linux um, um, uh, command, on my executable. This gives me a total list of all the libraries that I depend on, and this is what I'm capturing um, to, to, to uh, as dependencies. Um, I'll show you later the, the script, how this works, um, and um, uh, this gives me the dependencies. So all of this actually runs on Ubuntu. I'm running this inside um, Docker images. Um, to make this a bit more convenient uh, from, from a Mac, I'll show you later as well. 
Um, the tricky part is that Amazon doesn't actually run Ubuntu. It runs um, Amazon Linux, which is based on uh, Red Hat. So um, there's a bit of um, things involved in actually copying um, dynamic library and executables from one Linux system to the other. I'll also show you later how, how this is going to work. Um, but basically, at the moment, you cannot really um, um, build this for the, for the target system. So what I have set up um, is um, basically the integration test. Um, you can test this locally. Um, so um, some clever guy found out what exact um, Red Hat version um, Amazon is using. And what he did is he actually run um, a Lambda function that sips together all the contents of the Lambda environment and puts this into this Red Hat container. And uh, this is basically what you can use. He, he offers that as a, as a Docker image. And this is basically what you can use as a local integration test that this actually works, uh, what you're doing. And um, then you have the Swift executable, the dynamic libraries. Then you need this JavaScript file. And you zip this together. And this is the package you upload to Lambda. Any questions so far on, on, on this setup? I'll show you a bit later. Yeah. So you have a JavaScript function calling a Swift package. How much uh, milliseconds adds the JavaScript part to your execution time? Is that like a, one or two? Is it not notable, or is there a lot of overhead in, involved when doing that exec? I haven't measured it. this, um, but when I, I can sh show uh, look later, mm -hmm. perhaps in CloudWatch. I mean, I'm calling um, a REST API to get the data from Spotify. This is obviously much longer than actually calling uh, an executable on the command line. Okay. Yeah. Um, this whole dance with like having your your Ubuntu sitting in a in a Docker container, etc. Is this necessary in this setup only? Is like the other things like if you, for example, use the IBM thing, um, can you then do the stuff like really locally on the Mac and like just compile for it, put it on, and it works? Or like is it specific for this setup, or is this like universal thing? Now? Well, Swift only exists, the Swift compiler exists for Ubuntu. So um, that's basically the environment you have to build it if you want to build it for Linux, right? But then it exists on the Mac, too. Like, I want to run it locally on the Mac. And take it. Yeah, sure. You, you can build it locally on a Mac, but Mac is not compatible with any Linux. So you have to build it on Linux first. OK. And this is currently uh, Ubuntu. And then f um, I'm not sure what IBM uses, but basically Linux is uh, backwards compatible. So you have to find an older version than they are running, and then it should work, or you do the trick um, with, the, with the dynamic libraries um, and uh, execute them in a certain way uh, to make this work on a different system. Mm -hmm. uh, did you try uh, to compile Swift on a Red Hat or an MII image? Or? So this is also, um, I've seen some tweets that uh, people actually try to do this, like Red Hat compiling the Swift compiler on Red Hat is not that tricky. It's a bit involved. Um, but uh, since this system worked really well, I didn't try. There's also like Red Hat and Amazon Linux are again not quite the same. Um, Amazon has recently started providing Docker images um, that are, but but they are the Docker images use a newer Amazon Linux than actually Lambda uses. So there are quite of uh, subtle some changes in, in involved to actually get this uh, working if you really want to build for the target system. So does it work? Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> just to, to, to prove the concept. So again, I wrote this um, Alexa skill. And obviously, I don't have much traffic on, on this, but I have maybe 4,000 um, invocation in the last few weeks. And the, 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 um, this line is the invocation calls, and this line are the arrows. So you can see you can call this a couple of thousand times without uh, many issues. Um, so basically, what I would like to show you is the demo. So um, can you read this? So basically, what I um, set up is a, is a standard Swift package manager project. Um, like it starts with the package Swift. Um, I put my code in a, in a library. Um, the main reason is that um, the software package man uh, Swift package manager, um, if it's a library, it um, automatically enables um, the, the testable flags. Flags, so I can easily test this. 
and also um, it helps me, it makes the, 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 the tests, uh, the unit tests um, um, easier. So basically how I develop is I TDD against this library, test my code, and then run some integration, and then finally upload, because uploading and then testing is a bit inconvenient. Um, as, a, as a front end to this library, I have for one, um, the actual Lambda, this is basically this command line executable that you can also invoke in the, on, on the command line. And um, as a second front end, I have this um, server, which is basically a way to offer the same functionality behind a HTTP server. I'm using Kitura for this. You could use any HTTP library that's out there on Swift, um, but I'll show you later. This is very convenient because that way you can actually connect the Alexa service directly to your local HTTP server and thus debug this service on in, in Xcode, right? So um, obviously you cannot attach a debugger once it's running in on, on, on Lambda. So this I, I only do on, on, on Mac OS because this is only a bug, uh, debug utility for me. And then when you generate the, the, the project, so again, you have these, um, these are the three targets I just showed you, Alexa skill as a library, Lambda front end, server front end, and the rest is basically um, the, the, the dependencies of all of this. Um, to make um, my Alexa service a bit simpler, I wrote a um, library called Alexa Skills Kit. Basically what this does, it um, decodes the JSON messages you get from the Alexa service, gives you a nice Swift structure, then you um, um, uh, build your response and it passes, uh, it generates back the, the JSON to send it back. Um, so you can check this out, this is open source on GitHub if you want to write your own skills. And um, then the, the server itself is also pretty simple. And um, so I'll start with the server because I show you how I debug this and then I'll show you how the, the Lambda front end works. And um, so basically this is um, plain uh, Kitura code. It listens on, on basically um, on, on, on the main, um, uh, on, on, on local host. And then basically it calls my um, um, Alexa skill handle. This is coming from um, this Alexa skill library. And this Alexa skill handler is also pretty easy. Uh, the way I did this, uh, the way Alexa skills get it, does it is basically it provides a, a protocol and you implement a couple of functions and you that's how you um, serve back the answers. And at the moment I'm just um, echoing back what you sent in. So this is not a lot of uh, code. Is this understandable so far? Right. Um, so, um, Let's actually start this server. So you can see it started on port 8090. And what I'm now doing is, so I'm starting a, um, So basically this local server, um, to actually make it accessible from Alexa, I'm using a tool called Ngrok. And basically what this does, it exposes my local server to the internet. So I can actually access this server now with this uh, URL. And then this uh, URL, I can paste into um, the Alexa console. This is how you set up new Alexa skills. It's basically, so the Alexa console is separate from Amazon console for some reason, um, but uh, this is the second half um, where you actually set up the Lambda, Lambda function. So what I'm having here is, basically this is how you set up an Alexa skill. And to use my local server, I'm pasting in this ngrok URL. And I configure the SSL certificate, that should be already it. And then basically, there, there are different ways to, to test Alexa skills. For example, if you have an actual hardware device, the, the, the device configured with your same account, then you would also you, be able to access your, developed, your development version of your skill through the hardware device. But to actually test this, and they also provide this service simulator. So if you run Swift uh, test, 
then it will answer. You see the call actually came into my local um, NGROC um, um, server and it called here my server on this line, right? You actually run debugger? It's at a breakpoint, and you can actually go through this code, right? So this is obviously convenient for debugging, uh, and uh, this trick um, is really How long will the Alexa test <clears throat> web interface wait for the response? Because, I mean, we're waiting now, right? It's yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's like 30 seconds. I think they have some, some sort of limit. That's not bad. At least you also get um, the output and the debug logging and this kind of stuff. Um, so let's right. um, So I told you it makes unit testing, having this in the library makes unit testing a bit easier. And just so I'm not lying, actually I do write tests. I think, <laughs> I, I think there are actually two tests you are interested here. Um, one set is, is actually unit tests on the on the Swift code, and the second set um, set of tests are integration tests that actually pretend to be a lambda invocation and execute um, uh, test the whole stack that you are um, exposing. So these are the the, the unit tests, and um, then I'm actually wrote a simple script. Um, maybe you are familiar with uh, Docker, but Docker basically provides images so. I have to build this for uh, Linux, but I don't want to install a virtual machine for Linux. Um, so what Docker helps me to do is it um, provides a simple image, and inside this image, I can actually build my Swift executable for um, Linux. I'm using um, um, a Swift image call from Swift Micro Swift. Basically, that's a guy that has um, created these images for all sorts of Swift versions. <coughs> and the Swift version I'm currently using, that's in uh, here, which is 3.02, so the, the, the latest one. So basically, I'm running um, a Docker image with this with version 3.02, and then inside this Docker image, I call Swift test. And it simply builds the the, the art form. So, um, so if I run this, you can see it builds the three targets. It executes the test, and this basically proves that your Swift code also runs on Linux. Like Linux and Mac versions of Swift are 99% compatible, but you sometimes run into issues, and not all of foundation is there, so it's uh, useful to actually do these tests uh, from time to time. So you're not coding something on a Mac, and then you run it on, on Linux, it doesn't work. So the, the second test um, you're interested in are integration tests. So now it gets a bit more involved. This is basically a diagram I showed in the presentation. Um, so this is pretty much the same as I've just shown you except like it also builds this on Ubuntu in uh, Swift version 3.02. The only difference is that this time it's the release version, right? Uh, because I want to deploy this uh, later. Then I talked about... Then I talked about that I want, I need to have all the dynamic libraries as the dependencies. So basically what I'm doing here, I run the same um, uh, Docker image and execute LDD on my executable. And basically what this spits out is a list of all the .so's that I need for this executable. The, the rest is just a fancy way to get rid of the parsers and um, get um, um, just the, the, the library names and where they are located. And basically then at the end, I copy this to a directory. That's, that's all they say. Then I have captured everything I need um, for, for this execution. Um, the next step, this was step three, I run the integration test. So this time I'm using not Ubuntu, but um, a, a, a lamb, a, 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 an image similar to Lambda. So there is um, a project called LAMCI. That's a project I mentioned before. They are trying to do a continuous integration project on Lambda. 
and um, they have um, um, a convenient um, Docker image um, for this. So I'm using their Docker image because it's very close to what you actually really um, execute on, 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 on Lambda. Um, so basically what this does is it's automatically calling it in a Node.js integration. And the, the Node.js script it calls is this one. This is also what I showed you in the, in the, in the presentation. I, I, this is the, this little um, script. So, um, so now the now there's there's the trick. Um, so I think many people know LD library parse, like the environment variable, how you can actually tell this in this directory my SO files, my my my, my dynamic um, dependencies are included. And um, this works nearly, but the problem is also the the libc version. So what I'm actually doing is I'm running, this is actually the, the runtime part of LDD. So LDD has a compile time part and the runtime part, and this needs to be compatible. And this is also something I copy from Ubuntu, and it's actually executable that calls my Lambda function with the right setup of libraries and libc functions, uh, libc version. So basically, I'm calling LDD Linux, Library pass, these are the libraries I captured from Ubuntu on my executable. Right. Um, once there is, um, what's the name, um, uh, the, when, when the interface is stable, in Swift 4, will this go away or will this stay? Not really, because this is more like about the execution environment. So, Different Linux versions have different uh, libcs, like, mm -hmm. like, like standard libraries in different versions. Mm -hmm. And basically what I'm making sure here is that I'm using the exact same libc version from Ubuntu, also for my program. And what, 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 they, what they do with this um, uh, binary interface that it API eventually- API stability was the word. Yeah. API stability, basically um, it, it, it says that I think um, the SOs and the executable are um, compatible even if they are from a different version. Like you could, I, I could compile my um, Alexa skill library with a different Swift version than my executable. Yeah. Like this would work. But it would not get rid of this LD Linux. Mm -hmm. The only way to get rid of all this is really to configure um, an Amazon Linux image and build the Swift compiler on this image and then build your own app on this. And then basically this would all go away. Um, to, to, to interface with, um, with this um, Lambda executable, basically that's um, standard in and standard out. So you are, um, how do I do this? Right, so the input to these executables here, basically I'm getting um, the, 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 the data as a, as a string. I convert it into JSON, pass this on to my um, Lambda executable. Then I'm listening on standard out. Whatever comes back, I pass this into JSON, and then I call the callback. Um, so basically, my Lambda executable creates the JSON as a string. I pass it as JSON and pass it back to 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 to. to Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what standard error is really catched in get because there is null. So how does that end up? But I'm not good in JavaScript. So standard error is basically a way to have any logging. So you cannot log to standard out anymore because that's already the way you send data. Yeah. So in order to have any logging, you have to send it to standard error. Ah, I see. Okay. And uh, this is basically a mechanism for me if there is a problem that at least I can have a log message. Some sort. So okay. basically, if anything um, throws an exception, or if there is a problem, then I'm going this, and then um, I uh, give back the message. And basically, what what Amazon does, it prints out this message, so I have some opportunity for debugging. Is standard error out of scope, or am I not familiar with? Because standard error is defined in one block, but in use in the next block. Um, yeah, that's what. Uh, it is JavaScript. It removed anyway. Yeah, because it's, 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 it's <laughs> JavaScript doesn't have block level scoping, it's function level only. 
So oh. the definition gets ah. pulled to the top of the function. Okay. The, the, like the, the next function. Locks. Uh, Probably something. I, I, I hate the JavaScript for special. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I tell you, please use Swift for this stuff. <laughs> the function, the function, and the function isn't normal, but in JavaScript it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can do the same with Swift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can fuck up any language. <laughs> oh, you can write Java in every language. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's execute this um, operation test. So basically, I'm running this. Basically, it rebuilds the, the Lambda executable again um, on Ubuntu. It runs the, the integration tests. So if you basically look at what I've done before, yeah, this is basically time out. But before you have seen, there was um, some JSON coming out. This is basically the same JSON you are seeing here. Right? So that's my integration test. I actually run this inside a Lambda container and get some JSON out, and I see if this is working. And basically, then this is where I'm sipping everything together. So you can see <coughs> there are quite a few libraries involved. Um, this is also one downside of the whole approach. Um, the whole SIP package is 25 megabytes in the end. And uh, Lambda has kind of a limit of 50 megabytes. Um, so if you also need some data, you probably run into some limits uh, quite soon. And some people may work around this, um, maybe putting putting your dependencies or your data on S3 and then pulling it in from your Lambda. Um, this is a bit hard to do with the, the libraries, of course. So then um, this is all zipped together, and it ends up in this zip file. So basically, if you uh, unzip this, it has the JavaScript, it has the executable, and all the libraries. And this is the LD Linux um, I'm using for um, inside my JavaScript. And then there are, there are several ways. Yeah. Um, I think we met at the Alexa Skill Workshop, um, and they used, so when they, they introduced um, their cloud, lib uh, cloud database key value store thing that I can't hardly remember the name. Dino MyODB, right? And to store data for Alexa skills. Um, that's, is that something you could use in your Swift code? Or is it that you would need to write in, in, in implement it yourself, more or less? Because yeah, basically, all these servers have REST APIs, and then you basically need to implement the REST APIs. OK. And um, this is a bit of a downside of Swift. Like for Node.js, there is. Yeah, there is a package, and it's quite easy. It's like three lines. Yeah. And Swift, it's basically you have to pretty much implement everything yourself. Okay, see. So Amazon does not provide anything right now for running Swift. OK. Um, they have fed, uh, um, Python is well supported, and um, JavaScript is well supported. <coughs> Java probably too, or so, but uh, I think Node.js is, is usually default, but what people use for this kind of stuff. Um, then to actually deploy all this, um, there are several ways, and there are lots of um, tools uh, springing up to making this a bit easier, basically what you have to do. Um, I'm showing you the, the, the manual way, but there are also tools that basically upload this automatically um, for you. Um, so this is um, the, the uh, the Amazon, the AWS console, which is separate to to, um, to the Alexa console. I've con configured here um, one already. Um, we set the, the, the Lambda functions, they are event triggered, and this is configured here. Basically, you can say what kind of a, a, a event this is. This could be, um, maybe I can show you. You see all the um, API gateway is if you would want to expose this function as a HTTP um, REST API, some IoT stuff, Alexa, um, CloudWatch, that's basically the monitoring system, S3, if you can upload files, there are a lot of events that you can attach your function to. But we are, um, I'm in this case, I'm interested in the Alexa skills kit um, event. And then the code, basically the zip file um, you upload here, um, it needs to be have a special directory um, a structure, but which I've already created, and this is all all there is to it. So I've done this already before. So what you then need to do, so previously I showed you how to debug a local server. What you need to do to make this happen is basically, this is like a URL for these services. Um, basically you go to your Alexa, 
system and say uh, use uh, lambda ARN, paste this in, you send this, and then you say the same thing, hope it works, and you get the JavaScript out. And to prove that I'm not lying, that is actually executed. Um, is this the right time? I'm not sure. So basically, CloudWatch is Amazon's um, locking service, and it's automatically attached to your Lambda function um, if, if you couldn't configure it properly. So all the, the lock output and the invocations are locked there. And then you are, this is already my function, and then. And 18th January 2056. Yeah. So here you see the invocation started. Um, and this used uh, 20.47 milliseconds. So maybe this also answers uh, the overhead of calling a command line. Uh, basically, this command doesn't do anything, right? So it is a gigabyte of memory, which is also. <laughs> so, so, so how much is that? How much do you pay for 100 milliseconds with uh, a gigabyte of memory? Yeah, it's usually use, use something. Okay, see. <laughs> it's very cheap, and you get the first million invocations for free every month. Okay. Uh, basically, if you run a simple Alexa script, you are not paying anything for for for, for them. Okay. okay um, this is pretty much what I had to show. Maybe um, this is the graph I've shown you with the invocation. And once you have it running on Lambda, you can basically generate this graph on how many invocations. So I have something like 150 calls requests per day. Um, these are the, I think I configured the error sometimes. You can do all sorts of alerting and monitoring uh, stuff and fancy, fancy things with the uh, cloud. Then a uh, quick wrap up. So um, basically what I've shown you is how to run um, Swift um, functions on, uh, on, on Lambda. So what are the pros and cons? Um, so Lambda itself, it's, it's not necessarily suitable for every project um, with the main caveat that you need to be stateless, right? There is no, like a, a function that executes only for a short amount of time, there is no state you have anywhere. So what you usually do is you have a separate uh, database or a separate service that actually captures the state if, if you need some. And so your service, what you want to implement needs to be stateless. Um, there are some limits, for example, limited time, five minutes, um, limited size, 550 megabytes. I assume this gets um, um, uh, relaxed after some while, but um, at the moment you have this issue. Um, latency is a bit of a tricky issue. <coughs> You cannot basically guarantee, guarantee the latency of this stuff. Um, what, what Amazon tries to do is basically it caches your Lambda servers as well. So if you execute one function and execute it again within a couple of minutes, then you get the same server. That way you um, don't have this warm up time of these servers. Um, so I think Amazon is pretty good in there, but um, um, yeah, it's, it's basically starting up something and shutting it down, right? And, um, and sometimes um, this involves latency. Um, tools um, are all over the place. There are maybe a dozen different tools springing up here and there. It's quite confusing all. Um, Amazon, Amazon uh, announced something called um, SAM. I forgot its name, server application. It's basically um, um, a configuration file that you can upload to, uh, to Amazon which automatically configures all your um, Amazon services, which in my opinion is a bit um, the, the, the Amazon way. There are also tools basically say deploy and it uploads all the stuff for, um, for you. And vendor login is a bit of an issue. Um, the code is pretty much, I mean, you seen, have seen I've wrapped a web server around it and it was the same code. So from code, you are okay. From the tools, you're pretty much buying into, into Amazon. And probably once you started with Lambda, you will probably want to use Dynamo, DB, and CloudWatch and whatnot, and then suddenly you're in the Amazon ecosystem. That might or might not be what you want. And um, as an upside, yeah, there's um, uh, hardly any server management. It's really 
if you, especially if you want to do a side project and we don't want to be involved in, in system administration, I think it's a, it's a pretty good system. Um, on Lambda, uh, I mentioned before, like a basic package is 25 megabytes. So it's already 50% of your 50 megabytes limit. Um, locking is a bit awkward because I'm using standard out for um, passing the data back. So I can't use that for locking. So you have to make sure that all your locking goes to standard error. Um, the ecosystem is basically non-existent. If you need library, probably you need to write it yourself. Um, but that's what GitHub for is for. So for example, I wrote this Alexa skills kit library um, that other people can use. And I think that the, the main upside here is that uh, <coughs> is, uh, memory and compute efficient. Um, so um, if, uh, because you're paying by time and by memory usage, that might be um, a good reason to use this. And that's all I had. So basically, um, um, I said Alexa Skills Kit is on GitHub. Um, the project I've shown you is called Swift Lambda App. You can use it as a template if you wish. Um, basically, it has all the scripts and all the unit tests and the integration tests set up. So you just um, add your own um, um, code. And I've also wrote a Medium post about serverless Swift, which summarizes uh, these ideas again. And, uh, otherwise, um, yeah, hit me up on, on Twitter if you have questions. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, I want to ask, like, as far as I understood it, um, you have a Swift function which gets called to a JavaScript by the Lambda environment. What if you want, because there's no Swift native API for or SDK uh, provided by Amazon, what if you want to write some data into an S3 bucket, mm -hmm. uh, does it again need to go over a JavaScript invoked <laughs> by the Swift Lambda to write into that S3 bucket? Or like, do we have an experience with that, accessing S3 mm -hmm. from, a, from Swift Lambda? So basically, what you would need to do inside your Swift executable, you would need to use Amazon's REST API for S3. So for all the um, Amazon functions, um, um, Amazon offers REST APIs, for example, writing stuff to S3, managing, deleting buckets, this kind of thing. But is there, is there a way, an SDK for doing that on Swift? No. Uh, well, there, is, there are SDKs made for S3 that yeah, usually are used for iOS, but I, you know? I, I think I've found one, but there because you can't use them, say, iOS only. Yeah, 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 stuff like I mean, that. They so kind of need to be because of the ABI stability right now. So if there are so, so then Google, binary distribution Google for fucking analytics stuff already on Swift? No. Well, if it's, like, that's an Objective C SDK. Oh, okay. Fuck so the, the, the tricky part with doing requests on Linux at the moment is that foundation is not well supported in this regard. Like, um, <laughs> this URL session doesn't work yet. Yeah, kind of. Um, so, what, <laughs> so what all these, oh, all these uh, frameworks, server so frameworks yeah. use, they uh, use a wrapper around curl. So curl is a standard Linux library. And they have a Swift wrapper around this. And uh, for example, Kitura offers such a module. And that's how I use um, Access Spotify. Mm. Basically, I'm using this library as a request. It's, it's also like five lines of code. It's, it's, it's not complicated. I have actually no, no idea, but I found out that actually the, the, it uses Alamo Fire, and I assume Alamo Fire won't work, which of course of GTD, no idea, but. Uh, <laughs> I of all don't use Alamo Fire because I find best APIs are so simple that you shouldn't use a dependency for this, but okay, <laughs> if you want. Talk, 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 talk to uh, um, Amazon. Talk it's to not the official from Amazon. There's no oh, official. Okay. It's just some, someone oh. was lazy. So, Oh, just able as a server application. <laughs> yeah, this is another tricky part. <laughs> Let, let's start with the server talk. Um, so what I'm using here instead of NSUL session and foundation, I'm using KitoraNet. This is basically the network library that comes with Ketura. 
vapor and all these frameworks they have uh, similar but different stuff. Um, this is basically how you in make a get request. Um, basically, you call one function and um, you have the data there, right? So Spotify actually gives me a CSV, uh, comma separate values, um, uh, dot stuff, but you can do whatever you want. Um, then, so curl is supported on Lambda, but it doesn't have the CA file to verify HTTPS. So basically what happens in the HTTPS is um, you kind of, as a client, you verify that this HTTP server is actually who it's claiming to be. Um, you can supply this CA file yourself. What I've done is disabled HTTPS because I, I'm not, it, it's not my, uh, my function that's compromised. It would be Spotify server that's compromised, which I don't care that much about. So, but you, you can make this work, but you have to provide um, this uh, CA file. And it's downloadable, uh, like for Mozilla, you get one uh, that basically contains all the certificates to check this. Um, if you take two steps back and like look, uh, look at the state of um, Swift on the server and Swift on Linux, um, how much of it do you think is there? Like how stable is it? How much, how much do you think like, oh, it's too much of a hassle or this is gonna be better or like the things that I used are probably like I would use something else the next time. What's your, what's your overall view of the whole situation? So what I have done is, is this um, Alexa skill. What we've done um, at work is uh, write a simple bot that for example, checks uh, Jenkins and posts a message into Slack. Um, I haven't taken it further than that. I think the main problem is the ecosystem and also a lot of people working in this field, they have no idea of Swift. What they use is, is no chance. So convincing your company to um, use Swift and no one else uses Swift might be a bit tricky, right? Um, that's the main issue. Personally, for, for simple project like this, I don't see it. At the setup time, like, okay, first is like the learning curve, but when you have like a hobby project and you've done this before from like to get it up and running, to set everything up that you described, how long does it take? It, it, it's pretty much a standard Swift package manager project, right? So. Yeah. Whatever I do, I always leave, um, uh, make it to a post on GitHub so other people can copy the code. I hope someone else jumps in and also provides maybe an S3 library <laughs> that I can use. Um, yeah. yeah, because I'm actually an iOS developer, but like uh, at starting of 2017, I jumped into the backend team and I'm expected to write a Lambda job which writes data to S3 and I don't have Java experience, I write Swift, so that talk is exactly targeting me. Cool. And I will definitely look into your repository. Yeah. And then let us know how, how it goes. If I succeed, I will let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so you, you, you mentioned uh, the IBM open something? Um, oh, Whisk, yeah. Um, IBM and Apple are kind of having a partnership on Swift. Um, wouldn't it be easier to use IBM Open Wix? Have you tried that? Is it how much of a difference is it? Do you know that? Since they already so, um, um, support Swift, you would basically get rid of all this hassle of sitting up libraries uh, and stuff. Okay, but you, you personally haven't tried it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty much because everyone who thinks about serverless is talking about Lambda. Uh, I'm not sure who exactly is using IBM. The, the, the advantage of IBM is actually it's open. I think their their systems even open source. You could even uh, support it on premises, like you can install it yourself. Yeah. And then have your own functions running. Yeah. Kitora is their thing, I think. Yeah. Well, one big issue I see with Swift on the servers, and which hasn't been addressed by anybody, let alone Apple, is that it's it is DDoS prune. The reason for this is that the hash value implementation for, for string, for example, doesn't have the avalanche properties. So if you append a single character to a string, then the hash value only changes slightly. Hmm. This makes it very easy to DDoS your server because your server will, at some point, put information into a dictionary with string keys. You just have to find a condition and bang goes your web server. So, and 
I've talked about this with Joe Block or Casey Carter on Twitter, one of the yeah. developers of Swift. And they basically don't care. Um, um, what, what I got out of this discussion is that it was news to them. Which but is kind of frightening. But, yeah. Yeah, but, the, but the basic hash protocol that they do, the, the hash of thing, doesn't, doesn't like. Uh, but you can make an implementation of the whole hash of the thing that where you can just like inject it with some 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 salt and and then everything's fine again. So yeah, but um, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, but it's a, it's a, like this this like some server people are are at it. It's not a, it's not a fundamental uh, thing that will not be that will not be solved once this and becomes have, a thing. They've they recently but found. It be solved on them. Uh, well, some of it's, a, it's a language from 2015. That, that, that's, uh, that's a problem. You can't say uh, we, we will be able to solve it. You have to say we have solved it. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a client. To it's it a, 20 years ago. Or it's a, it's like a client saying language for the for the most part of the time uh, period. So like the server thing is like really new okay. to them, and they kind of like like let IBM more or less uh, do uh -huh. it. And, uh, and they, they, they founded these server working groups, right? So uh, yeah. I would hope and expect that they... they yeah, but you would have to change these server working groups um, to actually make it secure. Um, because you wouldn't want to have a cryptographic hash all the time. You would want to inject your, your, your hasher. And for this, you would have to completely rip out hashable and make it a, a visitor-style API. Um, and pretty much the same issue has been discussed with Rust, and they decided for a cryptographically secure hash, um, which makes the, the hash table implementation of Rust slightly slower than, for example, Swift or C++, but you can, you can replace it with your own uh, BNB hash or whatever. Um, you would have to do this, and this would break basically every use of, uh, of, of the hash of implementation. As long as Swift isn't like popular on the server, you don't have to care about it. As soon as it gets popular, you might have to target it. Okay, but then it's solid. Yeah. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, it's a hobby project, and uh, Swift is uh, a beautiful language, so it's fun, it's worth it. But uh, if you're on the clock, uh, uh, how much easier would have been to do it in Python or in Go to just a simple uh, server? <laughs> I mean, we, we've we started a um, um, Facebook Messenger board with Claudia.js recently, and it's pretty, uh, you know, one command to set up a, a skeleton, a couple of commands, you upload it and you're running, right? It's what the, 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 the amount of libraries and tools for JavaScript is, is, is quite amazing, right? Um, that, that said, I think different languages have different strengths. For example, if you are into machine learning, you probably would use Python, like scikit-learn or TensorFlow, all these libraries are available in Python. Maybe if you do some front-end stuff, it's more Node.js. Maybe, and then you are coming to the point where you're a bit like microservices, different programming language anyway. Yeah. So maybe in some space of this, uh, there's a place for Swift. And I mean, especially if you have no backend developer on your iOS team and you just, just need a small service that handles one file and uploads it to S3, it could make sense to do that I mean, on your own. It's, it's pretty much the same argument for Go and Rust, right? But there are also people that say, um, we implement all our stuff in Go for some reason. It's kind of these modern native languages um, that are popular. Yeah. <laughs> um, for someone who just uh, heard about Lambda on Edge, um, will that will that help you with the latency? Latency? Lambda on Edge. Uh, the way I understood it, it's like in their cloud front layer, like it's basically a caching mechanism. And I'm not sure there are some requirements. I think you you have to statically produce something, or you cannot. So something your, else. your consumption of Spotify yeah. would break it, I guess. Yeah. So that's, that's where I want to break it. Okay. Yeah, I think so. so it's some kind of CDN mode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And somehow you can also um, run what they call Lambda on Edge, but I think it cannot access anything else. It can only do something internal. Cool. Thank you very much.